So good morning, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Things I Believe Now That I'm Old. Just so you know right up front, I am a developer, engineer, long time, but this is a soft talk. So if you want to get the heck out of here, I'm totally okay with that. You won't hurt my feelings. All right, just check it. Okay, so my name is Ross Tuck. Uh, I'm a coach, consultant, engineer. I try and help people write better code or write it for them. I'm a Scorpio. I like books, hats, long romantic walks on the beach. But with a title like Things I Believe Now That I'm Old, all you probably care about knowing is, so how old are you anyways? To which I'm proud to respond, I actually had my birthday this month, so I've reached an important milestone. I'm officially 30 years old. Okay, so I'm not actually that old. The, the title is very much tongue in cheek. Though in my defense, I've actually been in this business for, ha for 15 years, which for the math buffs among you is, well, half my life. That's not enough to be a gray beard, but it, you know, it's, it's not nothing, right? But the main thing I've noticed about turning 30 is that it's not about how many birthdays you've had anymore. It's about how many you've got left, okay? So with that in mind, I'd like to tell you a story about a birthday I had a couple years ago. I was at home cooking dinner, and my girlfriend came in. And she said, honey, I love you. I said, oh, that's sweet, I love you. What do you want for your birthday? I was like, what? She's like, honey, I love you, but you are really hard to shop for. So this year, just tell me what you want, and I'll get you that instead. I was like, I don't know. I was like chopping vegetables at the time, and I was like, I could use a new chef's knife. That's something I would actually get some use out of. She's like, fine, you're getting a chef's knife. All right? There's only one problem. My girlfriend is a very, very smart lady, but she doesn't know anything about knives. But as it turns out, she didn't have to. You see, she's familiar with this website you might have heard about. It's called Reddit. Yeah, a couple folks. Now, the great thing about Reddit is that it's full of all these little sub-communities like Ask Culinary. And the great thing about Ask Culinary, besides their blurry logo, is that they're full of all sorts of people who work in the culinary industry. I'm talking about like professional chefs, servers, people who manufacture kitchen equipment, home cooks, and they'll answer any question you have. But my girlfriend didn't even have to ask her question. All she had to do was go here and search, and she found several other people had asked the same question before her, and she was able to read through and make a decision about the right knife for me. Now, that's how I became the proud owner of a Victorian Ox Firebox chef's knife. And I gotta tell you, if you're in the market for a new chef's knife, this one is pretty great. Non-slip handle, good balance, real sturdy, and it, of course, it's very, very sharp. <laughs> okay? Now, this leads to an interesting question. How did my girlfriend, who knows nothing about knives, purchase like the perfect knife for me? I mean, this is way better than anything we would have got just walking into a store and buying something off the shelf. I would argue it's because she had access to something very special. She was able to get advice about knives. Now, let me be really clear what I'm talking about here, because we use the word advice lightly. I'm not talking about data, like charts and tables and stuff about knives. I'm not talking about random facts like the metals and alloys or how one cuts compared to another. And I'm certainly not talking about related resources like a group of websites or documents you can read to become an expert on knives yourself. I'm talking about advice, specific directed recommendations for your circumstances. Now, in the old days, advice was very special. It came down from on high from people like Dear Abby or these days Dan Savage. But the internet has changed all that. These days, I can go to one website and I can ask questions to experts in any field. Or I can go to another website and ask questions to people who aren't experts in any field, okay? I can find out where should I eat? What movie should I see? How should I do my job? Where can I go in person to get more advice? So the internet has changed advice. It has made it cheap to give and easy to get, which is great because while I have my suspicions about some of you, I personally am not an immortal vampire. I do not have an unlimited amount of time to figure out everything it is I want to know. And I have less time all the time. So that is the value of advice. It is essentially distilled experience. It is a quicker way to use a body of knowledge without having to build it up yourself, which is great. But we're developers, and we always want to optimize further. So in that spirit, I would today would like to give you some advice about advice. And to underscore the points I'm going to make, I'm going to use actual advice I've been given. And if that makes you think, we need to go deeper, <laughs> then I'll remind you that you're developers, and it's called recursion, not inception, okay? 
So we're gonna cover seven steps to use whenever you get a piece of advice. Now let's dive in. Step one, it may not be the most polite thing in the world to say, but I think the first thing you should do when someone gives you a piece of advice is consider the source. Consider the person giving you the advice. Now, I like to do this in kind of a graph scale. All right, on the one axis here, we've got the capability of the person. Are they an expert in their field? Do they have a lot of experience with this? Or perhaps they're just starting out or even actively bad at it, okay? And on the other axis here, we have how helpful the person is. Are they invested in your cause? Do they share the same goal? Or perhaps they're actively harmed by what you're trying to do or just fundamentally opposed to it, okay? If I were gonna chart somebody, like say a lead developer on this graph, then I would probably put them somewhere around here. These are people with many years of experience, all right? They clearly know what they're doing, and they're very helpful. They're invested in your success. If I were gonna chart a junior developer, on the other hand, I'd probably put them somewhere around here. Some skill in what they're doing, but you know, not quite as much experience as a lead developer. But for some reason, junior developers, always that little smidge more helpful. I don't know why that is. Maybe they haven't learned the value of saying no yet. Maybe they wanna make a good impression, but always just that little bit more helpful. Now keep in mind, this isn't about who's right or who's wrong, all right? The advice is essentially neutral. This is about the subconscious weight that you give, uh, that you give to everyone who gives you a piece of advice, okay? And if you're gonna do that implicitly, you might as well make it explicit in your mind so you can consider that and try and overcome your cognitive biases, all right? Now this is good and bad. In general, if all advice seems equal, then listen to your elders. These are people with more experience than you, more context, maybe they've been in the same situation yourself, okay? So, Listen to your elders is good advice, but your elders are in general people. They are not infallible. They do make mistakes. I'll tell you an example from the very, very beginning of my career. I was working at this local web development shop. It was my first real job, and I was doing stuff like, you know, pulling stock photos, cropping images, things like that. And it was fun, but I wanted to do more. So I saved up the money I was making, and I went out and I bought this book. And you can laugh at me if you want, but it is no understatement to say that this book changed my life. Okay? It was my first introduction to you. You put something into a text editor, you save, hit refresh, and something appears on the screen. And yeah, maybe it was just an HTML table, but to me it was magical, and I was hooked instantly. So I was dragging this book around with me everywhere, reading it at lunch breaks, doing the exercises, showing it off. I was really, really happy with it. Right? And this went on for about a month. And then my colleagues came up to me. They said, Ross, we think it's awesome you're trying to expand your skill set. It's awesome that you're trying to improve yourself, but we think you should stop with this HTML stuff because Flash is the future of the internet. <laughs> All right, now keep in mind, this was the year 2000. There was a lot of crazy shit happening in IT in the year 2000, All right, So they were not alone in this opinion, and it seemed kind of legit when they said it. All right, now spoiler alert, we know it didn't quite turn out that way. Though in their defense, it did take another 10 years to get that far, right? So my colleagues, genuinely helpful, genuinely trying to give me the best advice, but when it came to predicting future industry trends, maybe not the best source of information. Now, keep in mind, this is not me saying I was smarter than they were, especially not at that point in my career. But what I did do was consider the source. I considered the fact that while they had more experience than me, it was mostly for the same web shop in the same small town building, the same thing for the same clients who wanted the same thing their neighbor had over and over and over again. And if I took a broader view and I looked at the industry and where it was going as a whole, it became clear to me that maybe HTML was the better investment for my time. And I think that paid off. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff about the capability axis here, but there's still this other one here, how helpful the person is, how invested they are in what you're doing. The good news is, is that in general, people want you to succeed. That people are awesome, they want you to be awesome too, and they will help you get there. The biggest danger you're gonna have is when you get advice like, your money is safe with Goldman Sachs, right? This type of advice is usually given to you by people who are experts in their field. They rank very highly in the capability axis, but their interests are not your interests, and you would do well to keep that in mind when dealing with them. And once in a while, I hate to admit it, but you will meet someone who just has it out for you. Some of you might be familiar with Joined In. It's a system we're using at this conference to rate speakers and kind of give them constructive feedback about their talks. It's, it's really great and you get a lot of really awesome feedback from it. Uh, let me share with you an actual review I've gotten from Joined In. One star out of five. I guess I'm the only one that did not like the presentation. Way too fast and he seems somewhat arrogant. What's up with the hat? Are you a cowboy in real life? <laughs> now, I question this person on both axes here. First off, 
the tone here is clearly insulting. I don't know who this person is or what I did to them, but I clearly made them mad and they're trying to hurt me. And therefore, maybe they're not the best source of advice. And at the same time, I question their capability in dealing with the world if they think that this is a cowboy hat. Okay? A good friend of mine, somebody I really, really respect, he once told me, you should be, he was really drunk at the time, he said, you should be more of a shark. I was like, what? But I realized eventually what he was trying to tell me is, I shouldn't worry about being the nice guy in every situation, that once in a while, you just have to stand your ground and stand up for what you believe in. That doesn't mean you have to be a jerk. There are nice sharks, but ultimately you have to take care of you because nobody else is going to. All right, so that brings us to step two. You've considered the source, the advice seems to kind of pass a quick laugh test. Now you need to consider the context. Consider if the uh, advice is actually applicable to your situation. I'll give you another example. I'm originally from the US, and several years ago, I moved from there to the Netherlands, where I reside to this day. I generally consider this to be one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. I'm very, very happy there. And once in a while, I get an email from someone in the US who sees that this worked out for me, and they ask for advice if they should do the same. And I always tell them the exact same thing. I say that when I moved there, I had one laptop bag, two suitcases, and 14 cardboard boxes. And that was the sum total of everything I was responsible for in the world. Some of the people who email me, on the other hand, they have kids. They have a spouse, or a house, or maybe a pet mouse. I don't know, okay? Point is, is that you can move to another country and succeed there under those circumstances. I know people have done it, but you have to admit, it is a very different situation. And what worked for me might not work for them. But that's a pretty extreme example. Let's consider something a little bit every day. What about when your boss or project manager comes in and says, hey, we found this annoying bug on live and I promised upper management to be fixed today. I know it's 3.30 p.m., but can you just fix that real quick? Can you just like hack it up and get it done? Now, this will not make me many friends at a technical conference, but sometimes, sometimes it's the right thing to do. Yes, if you have an issue in production, you should write unit tests for it, you should write regression tests for it, you should refactor it, you should figure out what the underlying arch architectural issue is. You should find out how it got through QA in the first place and you should run git blame and go have a talk with whoever committed that, all right? But in the meantime, your server's on fire and somebody's gotta put that sucker out, okay? It is all a matter of context and the context here is very important. I would argue that in the old days, we didn't share much or we didn't care much about context. Maybe we were too busy off in a corner writing code or maybe the business didn't deign to share it with the nerds. But I would argue that's changing. I would argue that the ascendance of techniques like BDD and DDD are because they're all about gathering context. And I would argue that many of the criticisms leveled against old practices like design patterns are because they are often applied without context. Ultimately, it comes down to that old saying, right tool for the right job. You know, which of these is better for chopping vegetables? My shiny new chef's knife or a chainsaw? Now, keep in mind the question is not which one is more awesome because we all know the answer to that. But if we're really objective about the matter, we have to admit that the chef's knife is the better tool here, even though it's not as much fun. At the same time, we shouldn't see a situation like this and then start running around online on Hacker News to claim, oh my God, chainsaws are an anti-pattern, never use a chainsaw. Because I hate to break it to you, I'm speaking from experience here, when a hurricane knocks a tree down on your house, or the dead rise from their graves, that chainsaw is gonna start looking pretty sweet right about now. It's all a matter of context. That brings us to step three. All right, you've considered the source, you've considered the context, you're still kind of with the advice. Now it's time for what's maybe the most difficult step in the entire process. You have to be open to the advice, even if you don't wanna hear it. Consider the chainsaws of the field. If you were to walk up to this guy and be like, hey, it seems like this is not working out the best, maybe you should consider this knife thing. Nine times out of 10, this person is gonna look at you and be like, knife? Yeah, I read about that on Hacker News. It's a fad. <laughs> Why would I invest my time in that? Besides, my vegetables are chopped. What's the problem? Right? This person is just gonna reject the suggestion out of hand because the question you're posing is, how do you chop vegetables? And to him, he already has an answer. The question is not, how do I chop vegetables better? Okay, and that's a very important difference. Uh, my mother always told me, you're never gonna learn anything with your mouth open. And that might sound like strange advice coming from a man on stage with a microphone, but it's a metaphor, okay? 
It's saying that if somebody asks a question and you feel like your job is to give an answer to it, then you're never gonna learn anything else because you think you already have an answer, right? You have to be open to that stuff. Unfortunately, this is something we usually have to learn the hard way, which is why I'm going to share with you now in public the single most humiliating story of my entire career. Many moons ago, when I was a young developer, I applied for a job at a really big tech company. Like if I said the name, everyone here would know who it was, techie or non-techie alike. And I somehow got past the phone screen. I felt like I knew enough to work there. And my friends and family were all like, you can do this, Ross, go do it, you know, take a step up. I was like, all right. So I show up and they immediately put me alone in a, in a room with a senior engineer and a whiteboard. And the difficulties are almost right away. His opening question is something like, let's say, I've got seven data streams distributed across the globe and I need to make sure that they're replicated no in time across this and this and the civil war here and a fire here and we need to make sure that the data is offloaded here because of this. How would you go about setting that up? I was like, I have no idea. He was like, okay, not, a, not a, you know, an ops person. Let's, let's try this, uh, let's try a software question. Let's say that I have a set of a million numbers and I need to distribute across this many nodes in less than a logarithmic time and we need to make sure that they're under these constraints and it's all good. I was like, I'm gonna draw on the board with this crown. He's like, all right, let's try this from the other end. He's like, do you know what a factory pattern is? <laughs> and that last one, that last one really gave him pause. He was like, wait a minute. He's like, have you ever heard of this book, Gang of Four Design Patterns? He's like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm self-taught, I've never heard of this book. He goes, well, what about the pragmatic programmer? No, sorry. And I had like a pen and paper with me, so I was like writing down the names of the books. And he saw I was doing this, so he listed like five or six more books, and I just kept writing them down. And he goes, okay, here's what you do. Read these books and have a nice day. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. I didn't walk in there feeling 10 feet tall, but man, when I left, I felt tiny. I was crushed, okay? You know, there's no other way to say it. I left a job interview with a reading list. It doesn't get worse than that. But here's the thing, I did. I did start reading the books on those lists. And I didn't understand them all at first, but I went off, I read other books, I came back to those books, and I'm still reading some of the books on that list to this day. But as a result of doing that, I got better. I got a lot better. And in the end, this was painful, but it became a pivotal moment in my career. This is when I stopped thinking of myself as a hacker who was hustling to put food on the table to when I started picturing myself as an engineer who had problems to solve. And I wish I had that same interview again today because you know what? I'm pretty sure I would get the job, but mostly I would want to say thanks to the guy who took that time to list those books. Maybe offer some advice about interpersonal communication skills, but mostly I would want to say thanks. Even this guy, even this guy who hates my guts for some reason, has something to teach me. Too fast. I do talk too fast when I present. I should work on that. Somewhat arrogant. What's up with the hat? I don't know. I don't feel arrogant, but maybe I come across that way. Maybe I really need to consider that. And if that's the case, I have to ask myself hard questions like, what's more important to me? The way I present myself or the message? that I'm trying to bring. You have to be open to advice, even if you don't want to hear it, especially if you don't want to hear it. Bruce Lee said, do you know why this cup is useful? Because it is empty. Step four, you are open to the advice. You're really trying to hear what it's telling you. Now it's time to use it. Otherwise, it doesn't mean a damn, okay? When I was writing this talk, I Googled a lot for quotes about advice, you know, advice about advice. This is the one that came up more than any other. Advice is what we ask for when we already know the answer, but wish we didn't. And if you're really honest with yourself, you have to admit this is often true. My mother and my grandmother have their own versions of this, if you'll excuse the profanity. My grandmother likes to say, shit or get off the pot. And my mother has her own version, which is, Ross, don't be a chicken shit. Uh, I'm not putting them in the best light. They're actually wonderful people. We're just, we're from the south of the US. We have colorful expressions is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Now, 
my grandmother's saying here is all about indecision and getting past that. And my mother's version here is all about getting past fear. Because these are the two main things that hold us back. And I wish I could tell you some magical advice that would make that you know, go away. But I can't. Uh, this is something I still struggle with all the time. I can tell you what I do, which is I ask myself, when I'm on the last six months of my life, when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to regret not having done this? And it's actually a pretty tough question to ask yourself. But if you do it often enough, it becomes something of a habit. And it will never become easy, but it will get easier to make the hard choices. But the reason it never becomes easy is because of one of life's great lessons, something we all have to learn sooner or later. Everything, everything comes with a price. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah. Yeah, this is Jiro Ono. He's a, he's a sushi chef in a uh, small restaurant in a Tokyo subway station. He's widely considered to be the greatest sushi chef in the entire world. He was a subject of a documentary, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, because he does. And if you look at these images from the documentary, which is a beautiful film, you have to agree, his work is just absolutely exquisite. If you want to eat at his restaurant, you have to reserve a year in advance, and it will cost you $300 per person. He has many repeat customers. All right. So Jiro is over 80 years old and still making sushi every day. He is the type of master craftsman we should all strive to be more like. This is Takashi. Takashi is Jiro's youngest son. He's also in the documentary. In there, he talks about you know, sort of his, his father as a father and his days as a young boy. And his father worked very hard in the restaurant. And once in a while, he would sleep in a little bit on Sundays before he went back to the restaurant for a seventh day in a row. Right? And he would creep in late at night, and he would fall asleep on the couch so he wouldn't wake the, rest of the, wake the rest of the family. And Takashi says he would wake up earlier than the rest of his folks, and he would go into the living room, and he would see his dad asleep there on the couch. And he would walk up to him, and he would look at him, and then he would turn around and run screaming to his mom, 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 there's a strange man in the house. Right? Jiro is a master craftsman. But the price to obtain that level of skill was that his son did not recognize him. That is a hell of a price to pay. Hell of a price. All right? Now, this tension between family and craft, I mean, that's the, the type of price we talk about the most often, but it's not the only one there is. Uh, there are all sorts of prices that you need to consider, and I think one of the most important ones that we often forget are the moral consequences of what we do. My mom always told me, you have to do what you think is right. Nathaniel Bornstein, one of the creators of mine, he has this awesome quote that I love. He says, no programmer would ever create a destroy Baghdad method. It would be unethical. We would create a destroy city method that you can give Baghdad to as a parameter. <laughs> and I hate to admit it, but it's pretty true. Software developers in the modern world have a lot of power, but very rarely do we consider the ethics of the things we're building. And at the risk of sounding a bit cheesy, there is a dark side. It is a very real thing. And yes, they may have cookies, but those cookies might come at the cost of your soul. And I think that certain revelations over the last couple of years that I'm not going to say into a wired device have made that pretty clear. Ultimately, though, there's a price. You either pay it or you don't pay it. And both are OK. Sometimes walking away from something is the hard decision. Sometimes it's the right decision. The important thing is that you choose, that you don't let these things just happen to you, but you choose what you want to be. And when you get done doing that, Always remember to go back and say thank you to the people who offered you advice, even if you didn't take it. Explain why you didn't. They may not agree with you, but I guarantee you they will respect you more, and they will be more likely to give you advice in the future when you need it again. That brings us to step five. So far, you, when someone offered you advice, you've considered the source, the context, you were open to it, you put it into practice. Now some time has passed. Now it's time to meditate on it, to look at back at what the advice has done for you and ask yourself tough questions, like, did it work as expected? Would you do it again? Did you get what you wanted? Are you happy? These are important questions to ask yourself, because badgers and humans alike have this bad habit of moving the goalpost, of trying to convince ourselves after the fact that we got what we wanted, even if we didn't. Now, we mostly do this through a process known as cognitive dissonance. Uh, this is a, uh, an issue humans have when they have two or more competing belief systems that don't quite line up in some places. They're, they leave gaps, and you can't resolve your beliefs into one consistent worldview. Um, the most common example of this, by which I mean the one on Wikipedia, is Aesop's fable of the fox and the grapes. 
Very simple story. You see this fox walking along, and he sees a bunch of grapes hanging over his head. He thinks, hmm, those are tasty, I want those. But they're like just out of his reach. He can't get them no matter what he does. So he tries like several things like Wile E. Coyote style, can't reach them. Um, and eventually he just gets mad, he gets frustrated, and he leaves like in a big huff, inexplicably dressed like a pimp, I don't know. Right? Now in the story, the fox has two conflicting beliefs. One, I want the grapes. Two, I can't have the grapes. And the fact that he can't resolve this into a single world outlook causes him psychological distress. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling for those of you who've never had that. All right? Now, ultimately, something's got to give. Now, the fox has already tried to get the grapes, but he can't reach them no matter what he does. The only mutable factor here is the fox himself. All he can do is change his own mind. So he tells, him something, tells himself something like, those grapes probably suck anyways. They're sour, and that's why somebody left them there. And suddenly, the situation becomes more bearable. You know, he doesn't feel bad that he can't reach the grapes anymore. And if you're interested in words, by the way, this is actually where the expression sour grapes comes from. Okay? In a nutshell, this is cognitive dissonance. If I were a little bit harsher about it, it is basically lying to yourself so that you feel better. And that is a dangerous thing to do, because if you do not remember where you started and compare yourself to where you're at, you'll never know if you're heading in the correct direction or if you veered off dangerously. Okay? You have to be honest with yourself. Maybe like before you make a big decision, write down what it is you hope to get out of it so that two or three months later, you can actually hold yourself accountable to that decision. You can't change your mind about what it is you actually wanted. At the same time, this is not a license to beat yourself up about every failure you ever have in your life. And it is okay to change your mind. When I was five, I wanted to be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs. Instead, I became a software engineer. A little bit of a shift. I don't feel bad about it, but I do know how it happened. Okay? It is important when you have these goals to create a realistic expectation. I'll give you an example. When I moved to the Netherlands, I had to learn how to ride a bike. Everybody in the Netherlands rides a bike. But very few people in the Netherlands ride a bike like Danny Macaskill. If you ever heard of Danny Macaskill, he's this, uh, one of the world's greatest freestyle cyclists. I love to watch his videos on YouTube. He is amazing. All right? Here he is riding his bike across a cable in a junkyard. Here he is jumping his bike between two cars of a train. Right? He's amazing. I highly recommend you check him out. Meanwhile, I'm happy to not be this guy. All right? And let's face it, that is a realistic expectation. I never set out to be Danny Mackeskill. I didn't set out to pay decades of my life to become that good. I just wanted to get from point A to point B without a concussion. I mostly succeed. Okay? My girlfriend turned me on to this idea of smart goals. Now, SMART is like five attributes that are carefully designed to form the word SMART. And this is somehow supposed to make you create better goals. I know this sounds super managery. It's actually from like a 1980s copy of Harvard Management Review. That's how managery this is. But, but hear me out, it's not bad. All right? SMART says that any goal you create should be specific. All right? It shouldn't be something vague like, I want to be a better programmer. Because how do you know? All right? It should be something specific like, I want to reread Martin Fowler's refactoring book. That is a good specific goal, all right? You will get concrete gains from that. Better, the goal is measurable. How do you know when you're a better programmer? You probably don't, but I can look at the page count of a book. I can see how many chapters I have to go, right? And that gives me a good feedback loop. As anybody with a Fitbit will tell you, when you can put something on a graph, it gets easier to do. The goal should also be attainable. It should push you to your limits, but it shouldn't be impossible for you right now. It should just stretch them a bit. Um, for example, I would love to read Knuth's Art of Computer Programming. I could not do it. I do not have the math, and I will leave frustrated and angry and probably of wasting my time. On the other hand, refactoring, that's a book I can digest. Right? It should also be relevant. I would love to be a master chef. It will probably not teach me anything about object-oriented design. And finally, the goal should be time-bound. Uh, not so much to stress yourself out, but to make the planning possible, to give you a little nudge to keep going. Right? So in a nutshell, that's SMART goals. Now, this might sound like I'm telling you to not be ambitious with your goals. Make them small, make them measurable. Nothing could be further from the truth. I want you to go for the moon, all right? But I want you to do it in a fashion of continuous improvement, basically agile development. Like when we're building a very complex project, we do not like, you know, start off with a waterfall approach because we know that doesn't work. Instead, we're gonna make continuous small steps, measuring them, doing a feedback analysis, and then going forward, one bit at a time. And that should be the same way that you try and improve yourself, in my opinion. All right? Now, some of you might have heard of tiger moms, this specific breed of hyper-aggressive mother that forced their children into being manufactured geniuses. 
Luckily, I don't have a tiger mom. My mom is way cooler and more mellow than I'll ever be, as all my friends tell me. But what I do have is a tiger best friend. My best friend's idea of advice is stuff like, you can do better. I'm like, at what? We're drinking beer. She's like, you can do better at life, everything. You can do better. And that might sound like kind of an unrealistic standard, but she's not alone in this opinion. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah, it took me forever to find a photo of this guy. This is Christopher Alexander. If you've never heard of him, he was a building architect in the 60s and 70s who wrote a series of books describing what he called a pattern language, which is a way of sharing reusable solutions to common problems. And this work, although it was meant for buildings, is the direct predecessor to the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. It was actually based on his work, even though it's for computer science. And years later, somebody asked him to write a foreword to a computer book. And in there, he talks about his relationships with his students, because he sort of sees us as his students, which we are. And he describes a student who actually is in one of his classes, though, and comes up to him, and she says, would you mind taking a look at a project I did? He's like, sure. So he kind of inspects, and he's like, yeah, this, this is quite good. This is well done. This is well made. But is it as good as Chartreuse? Is it as good as this famous cathedral? And she says, no. And she like laughs in his face. She's like, it's a, it's a gas station or something like that. You know, she's like, I never set out to build something that good. And even if I wanted to, I couldn't. And he writes about how this frustrates him, this failure to hold yourself to a higher standard. He writes, that standard must be our standard. If you are going to be a builder, no other standard is worthwhile. It is what I expect of myself, and it is what I, in my own buildings, and it is what I expect of my students. He goes on to say, gradually, I show the students that they have a right to ask this of themselves. And in fact, they must ask this of themselves. And keep in mind, he's not talking about architecture students, at least really. He's talking about us. He's talking about our failure as an industry to hold ourselves to a higher standard. All right. Now, it might seem arrogant for us to compare ourselves to master craftsmen like Christopher Alexander to Giro. And in fact, it would be arrogant to compare ourselves. But I do not believe it is arrogant to compare our work to their work for the purposes of not glorifying ourselves, but to understand where we fall short so that we have a better idea of where to go forward. In fact, I would go so far as to say that this is a form of intellectual honesty, to compare yourself not just to the person in the cubicle next to you, but to the biggest badass there is. Because that person is actually out there, and that's the state of the art. The danger of doing so is that you'll become discouraged, because every day you'll be comparing yourself to someone who you can never live up to. All right? Please don't let that happen. If that is happening, I would argue that it's because you're mixing your self-worth as a person with your self-worth as a profession. And those are two very different things. Compare yourself to someone who's an expert in a field you have no emotional attachment to. Do I look at Danny Mackeskill and think, Oh, what am I doing with my life? No, I think, wow, that's amazing. And I don't always have that, in, that attitude when I look at the work of other engineers, but it's the attitude I try to have. That brings us to step six. You've meditated on the advice. You've kind of put it in perspective a little bit. Now it's time to give it. Now it's time to pass it on to someone else. Some people say you should do this at the start. I always pass on good advice, says Oscar Wilde. It is the only thing to do with it. But I prefer the med student version. Watch one, do one, teach one. Because it emphasizes the idea you don't have to be an expert in a field to make a meaningful contribution. You just need to be one step further along in the path. Now, this is not a license to run around and make divine statements about how everything should be, OK? Start small. Give advice on small things. I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, I was at a conference, and there was a young speaker who was about to go on stage the next day and give his first big talk, and he was really nervous. So he was in the speaker's lounge asking if he could present a small five-minute piece of his talk and get some feedback on it. And we said, sure, by all means. All right? So he was doing his talk, and it was going well, but I noticed that he had this bad habit of staring at his monitor, not really looking at the crowd. He's just sort of reading off of it, which, as you can tell, is kind of distracting. It makes it hard to connect with the speaker. And I called him on it. I said, Hey, you really need to work on it. I had the same problem in the beginning, too. It's because when you practice a lot, you don't have anything to look at. What you need is something to make eye contact with, past the monitor, something you can actually look at with the face. Do what I do. Use a stuffed animal. Man, I didn't think the other speakers would ever stop laughing at me. All right. But you know what? Next day before his talk, same guy came up to me in the hallway. He said, Ross, 
I tried the stuffed animal thing. I laughed at myself a lot, but once I got going, I feel like it really made a difference. Thank you. But don't tell anyone, okay? All right. Now, I wish I could take credit for this awesome form of training, but honestly, it's just a souped up form of rubber duck debugging, which somebody else taught me. But that brings us to an interesting point about advice. Advice are usually short, pithy statements that we pass around a lot, right? Advice are memes. And just like Dawkins writes, memes evolve over time. You know, they become applicable to new circumstances like the rubber duck. They become shorter, easier to remember. Uh, they sometimes change meaning completely. Uh, they, you know, become dual types and learn cool moves like fire blast. Right? So by passing memes around, you're actually furthering the total sum of human knowledge, which is kind of an awesome, noble goal. But just don't let that go to your head. Always remember to be humble. I mean, like, for example, today I'm in a foreign country where they flew me in to stand in front of you and give an awesome talk right here in this great room. Tomorrow, I will go home where I'm a man who does PowerPoint to teddy bears. Right? You have to keep these things in perspective. And if you ever doubt your ability to pass advice on to someone else, just remember you are where you are today because somebody gave you advice at some point. So you owe it to pass it on to someone else. All I'm doing is saying be responsible when you do it. Dijkstra says, we must be very careful when we give advice to younger people. Sometimes they follow it. All right? That brings us to the last step in the process here. All right? You've considered the advice, you've meditated on it, you've passed it on to someone else. Hopefully some of these previous steps have changed your circumstances in some way. They've altered where you are in the world. And that opens you up to the possibility of collecting more advice. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, the best way to do this is to change your environment. And specifically, like in your work environment. You can institute practices like code review for every pull request. This is a great way to get direct feedback and it doesn't cost as much time as you think. Sprint retrospectives are often overlooked but they are a crucial part of doing good project management. 360 feedback, like where your annual or biannual reviews are not just for the people under you but also for the people above you, often brings some really interesting advice to light. And internal workshops, just on a Friday afternoon with a beer talking about code, are a great way to spark discussions and solve problems. They are all great sources of advice. The key rule for all of these is that you must make the participants feel safe. Occasionally clients hire me to lead their internal teams, and I say, we're gonna do code review, and there's only one rule for code review. You can say anything you want about the code. You can say it's badly written, that it was a waste of time, that it doesn't apply to the situation, that it stinks to high heaven. But the moment you make it feel personal, the moment you make it about the person who wrote the code, that's it. I don't want you on the team anymore. All right? And if none of these are applicable in your circumstances, ask. Ask a lot. Ask everyone. Ask until you're blue in the face. Ask until they think you're seeing a psychiatrist for self-insecurity issues. And keep asking. And don't be afraid to ask what Rowan Mearwood calls the dumb freaking questions. Because the stupidest questions often have the smartest answers. And besides, somebody's got to ask them. All right. Remember, the goal is continuous improvement, and that means a constant, small, steady stream of advice. If you don't have that, you can't improve. Now, there's another interesting facet here that makes it important to keep gathering advice, which is you never know what you're going to need. Certain advice is better for certain situations. It's all about context, right? When I was a kid, there was nothing I hated more than the saying, you'll understand when you're older. How condescending is that? I'm like, I'm not stupid. You understand. Explain it to me. And then we'll both understand. And so it pains me to stand here before you and say this. It's true. There are some things you only understand until you've experienced them firsthand. Like your first heartbreak. Intellectually, you understand it before it happens. But nothing prepares you for it. And that's the crazy thing about our device. It only unlocks over time. Like when someone gives you a piece of advice, you think you understand it. You think you understand what the message is right away. But it's not until often years later, like when you're in the shower washing your hair or something, and you're like, my God, that thing my seventh grade science teacher said, I understand now, it's full of stars. You know, we all have these moments. And it, I don't understand why that is, but we don't understand what people are trying to tell us until some time later. So knowing that, there's only one reasonable thing to do here. Stockpile the crap out of it. Even if the advice seems crazy, keep it for later, because you never know what it's going to turn into. 
Last Pokemon joke, I promise. All right. So I go to a lot of conferences, and something I'm always on the lookout for are developers over the age of 55, because let's face it, these people should be the mother load. I mean, they've got like as much experience as you can practically have in the industry. And unfortunately, I've only found about five of them so far. It was five of them so far. And what I think is interesting is that three of them have told me the exact same piece of advice independently from each other. They've all said, find a mentor. That nothing was more important in their entire career than finding someone who would give them feedback on a regular basis and was invested in their success. It was the most important thing they ever did. So take that for what you will. But I think that's about all the time I have for today. So I'm just going to give you a quick wrap up of the steps to use when somebody gives you a piece of advice. Remember, consider the source. Consider the person giving you the advice. Next, consider the context. Is the advice actually applicable to your situation? Remember to always be open to the advice, even if you don't want to hear it, especially if you don't want to hear it. Then you have to use the advice. If you just take it and you never do anything with it, it's not worth a damn. After some time has passed, meditate on the advice. Consider what it's done for you. Ask yourself the tough questions. And then when you have it in perspective, pass that advice on to someone else. If it worked out well, recommend it. If it didn't, warn them off from it. Both are valuable tips. And then finally, hopefully, one of these previous steps has changed your circumstances in some way so that it opens you up to collecting more advice. And as I'm sure you've noticed by now, this is just one never-ending cycle. You know, inception. So I hope you go forward and you enjoy the rest of the conference, because let's face it, there are some amazing speakers here this weekend, and I'm honored to be a part of that. But I hope as you watch their talks, you will listen to not just the technical knowledge they're trying to impart, but to the deeper lessons they're trying to bring you. Things like, if it's broke, check your assumptions, not the code. You have a responsibility to keep your users safe, that you need to consider every solution, that using something well means learning it well, that lessons from other domains can work in your domain, that sharing vocabulary helps you share solutions, that art is important, that the impact of automating a task is bigger than just that one task, that curiosity is at the core of what we do, that accessibility for a user is always the first challenge they will face, and that ultimately we build for people, and that eloquence is a learned skill. And I'd like to think that I'm telling you to make your time count, because you will never have enough of it. All right? If you're going to do something at this conference, I hope that it is to meet new people. Not just speakers, but fellow attendees, volunteers, everyone you possibly can. Because advice, advice doesn't come from nothing. Advice comes from people. It comes from things that they've learned, things that they've lived, things that they've paid for. And when someone shares a part of themselves with you to make you better or stronger, if that is an open source, I don't know what is. This talk is called Things I Believe Now That I'm Old. But really, it's a terrible title. I'm not old. It's not about what I believe. It's not even about me. It's about the people who got me to where I am today. And this talk should be for them. It should be called The People. The people I believe in now that I'm old. Well, older. Thank you for your time.